Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Hallelujah. I don't know if anybody is here, but this is your first time. But if you are... Thank you for coming. This is just one of those different kind of days, different kind of churches. We're glad to have you in the house. Summer is in full swing. I'm sick of it. I'm I'm mad every day. You see that meme that's on on Facebook where people said, it's 95 degrees outside. Watch how you talk to me. (laughs) Use the tone wisely. That's how we feel. Welcome to Florida. That's just the way it is. We bless you. Glad to have you with us this morning. Um, I'm just going to get right to work this morning. It is a a busy summer. Uh, Food truck day is today. I'm I'm excited about that. (laughs) I'm a hot dog guy. There's a hot dog truck outside, and the popsicle lady is here, so we're going to support them at the end of our service. When you drop out of the building, grab something to go if you want. Um, And if you are here today wondering what's going on with our future, uh, stay until the end. I'm going to give an announcement and an update about where we are with the purchase of the land and what all we're doing with that. It's worth hearing, so stick around. Amen? Amen. John chapter 2, if you have your Bible there, turn there with us, please. We welcome everybody who is online. Find your Bible. Turn there with us. John chapter 2 is early in the ministry of Jesus, very early in his ministry. He's just getting started. By this time, what we know about his short tenure in ministry is that he has been baptized. He has called the first few of his disciples to him. He's shown up at a wedding and he's turned water into wine. And that's it. By John chapter 2, that's where he is. Uh, He's been baptized. I mean, it it has been eventful. He's been baptized. The heavens opened. The Spirit of the Lord came down. The voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. He has gone to a wedding, and when they ran out of wine, he kept the party going and turned the water into wine. And then he has called just a few of his disciples. And so he is known, but he is a relative unknown. He is not really known, which makes this even more noticeable because he is a relative newcomer to the scene there where he is right now. And what's about to happen will become even more shocking when you realize that he is, in fact, a newcomer to this moment. So, John chapter 2, if you wouldn't mind, I know you've been standing. Would you stand for the the honor of reading God's Word together? John chapter 2, starting in verse 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation today. Verse 13, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins all over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then, going over to the people who sold doves, (laughs) I love Jesus, he said, y'all need to get on out of here. He told them, get these things out of here and stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Mm. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. That passion for God's house will consume me. Passion for God's house will consume me. This morning, I want to speak to you just for a few moments about the passion of Jesus. And how important that is to us and in us. The passion of Jesus. That what you read from those words right there has to find a living translation into our lives and into the church. So Father, have your way today. Let us hear with ears that are ready to respond. And we thank you for it. And they said together, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for your honor. One of the most commonly thrown around reports today And it has become so common that it sounds like it is almost gleefully being reported. Is the decay and the demise of the church. It is very common. It's very 
commonly being reported, and, and sometimes I think it's gleefully being reported, the, the decay of well, the church is not what it used to be, the demise, it's, it's on its way out. I'm sure you've heard something or you've heard some variation of it. The word is that the institution of the church around the world is a mess. It's not really arguable, unfortunately. It's not really arguable that in many ways it is a mess. It is in many ways falling, failing, fading, shrinking, losing influence, losing members, leaders are falling. Seems like every other day there's a headline of some kind that we get swept up in because, oh, you go to church, don't you? Well, what about... It's being reported that, and I've heard this more lately in the last few years than I've heard in my whole life, that the glory days of the church are over. That all we can hope for moving forward is limited influence and half-empty buildings. We will never see what we had seen before. Congregations are aging out. Old folks are dying and young folks are just not showing up. They've, they've decided to walk away from the institution of it all. And a recent report says that it's true. 20 years ago, 42% of all American adults attended church in the United States of America. But right now that number is down to 30%. So in just 20 years, we went from 42% down to 30%. That's a massive number. Christianity is expected to lose 66 million members by 2050. <laughs> Which means that in the next 26 years, it is being reported... Congratulations, young man. That 66 million members will move away from the church and not go back. The Washington Post has a name for it. It's called the Great De-Churching of America. It's truly shocking. As a result of such a shocking number, the, the Gallup polling organization decided to, to do what they do and they, they conducted a survey. One of the largest surveys that they've done in a while. It was 13,000 people in 130 different nations of the world. The Gallup poll went out to 13,000 people in 130 different countries who used to attend church, who used to be active in church and are no longer, asking multiple questions. But one of them was, one of the questions was, what would it take to get you back into the church? What would it take to get you back into attending church? As you can imagine, there were probably thousands of different answers to that particular question, but the number one answer... The number one answer that stood out far and above away from all of the others was this that I'm about to give you. They said, quote, we want to see passion in the lives of the members and the leaders. That's what we want. What would it take to bring you back to the institution of the church? It was not advertising. Oh, we need to buy more advertising. It was not events. Well, we need to have bigger events. It was not crusades or causes or concerts. All of the things that we try to use to put a band-aid on failing attendance. It is not better preaching, better music, or more programs. They wanted to see that the people actually believed what they said that they believed. And then that, that belief would translate into a credible and a measurable action. Y'all write this down. They wanted to see proof in the form of conviction and action and faith. Amen. Their words, not mine. So don't, don't, don't hurl your Bible at me. They wanted to see something more than they saw week after week in the lives of the people just before they got up from their seat one Sunday, walked out and said, I am never going back to that place. And if those numbers hold true and they're predicting correctly within the next 26 years, there will be, as they say, 66 million more people who will follow suit and do exactly the same. It's a statement. It's a statement that stings when we hear it. 
And it is, it, it is formulated in, in, in this conglomeration of thoughts that they said that I can put up with hypocrisy. If I see hypocrisy, I can put up with it. I can put up with cliques. Y'all's little groups that y'all get in and just hang out with my group and I don't talk to y'all's group and denominations have gotten us all divided and split up and we don't talk to the Baptists and they don't talk to the Pentecostals. I can put up with your cliques. I can put up with your politics. Those silly little games that y'all play. I can, I can put up with bad theology. And boy, oh boy, is there a lot of bad theology in the church world today. I can put up with scandal. The preacher, he might fall. I, 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 can, I can understand that because we're all human. I, get, I can put up with bad sound, bad singing, dirty bathrooms, uncut grass, and uncomfortable chairs. But I cannot sit there and watch everyone yawning their way through another Sunday service. That's what they said. I can't, I can't do it. Scrolling Facebook and wishing they were somewhere else. Jared said it, and I can't stop. Where did he go? <laughs> did anybody hear a trumpet? I, wow. My God, I'm so used to seeing you there, son. Say something before you go. I just had a heart palpitation. Oh, Jesus. Second person I was going to check is, where's his mama? If she's still here, we're all good. We're all right. If they're both gone, we're going to hell. Jared said it. And I can't stop. That's going to end up on YouTube. I cannot stop saying it. That we don't, he said it, we don't need any more boring churches. We need some burning churches where believers believe what they say they believe. Which is what we see in John chapter 2. In Jesus. We call it extreme. It was ordinary. And the disciples, when they tried to find a name to put on it, they called it passion. The New King James says the zeal. The King James says the zeal. This passion, this translation says passion. It is defined as intense conviction that fuels or motivates us to compelling action. Jesus walks into the temple. And when he sees what they are doing, somewhat similar to him maybe walking into our church or a church. When he walked into the church and he saw what they were doing, his response was everything but what would be recommended by any church growth consultant in our world right now. It wasn't polite. He didn't care at that moment about their feelings. He wasn't sensitive. He wasn't seeker friendly. Literally everything that we have been told is important in life and in the church. In the business world and in the church world. It's all of that stuff is important. No, no, no. He stepped aside. He made a whip. And he came back and cleared the house. And the word that the disciples used to describe what he just did was passion. Passion in, in, in three words means jealousy, fervency, and indignation. I love, I love the word indignation. Jealousy, yes. Fervency, absolutely. But indignation stirs my soul. I love the word indignation. It is strong displeasure at something considered unjust, offensive, and insulting. You've got to see that. That when Jesus saw what was unjust, offensive, and insulting... His response was not the typical response of the 2024 Christian. It's going to get bumpy in here, so hang on. Because in our day, what they say is, you know what, we, we just need to be a little bit more tolerant. We need to be more tolerant, more inclusive, and more understanding of all of this stuff and all of these cultures and all of these new movements that are, that are coming up. Maybe we need to have some classes at the church so that we can better understand it and we can better relate to it and be more sensitive to how they feel and, and, and what it is that they're doing right now as they're pursuing this path. Times have changed. Things have changed. People have changed. The best way for us to stand up for truth is to just be quiet and hope that our love will shine through. That's the contemporary church model. We don't need to offend anyone. 
If we come on too strong, what's going to happen is that we're just going to push everybody away. So, so y'all need to just calm down and be a little bit more inclusive. You, Jesus made a whip. <laughs> Write that in the margin of your Bible. Jesus made a whip. This was happening on Passover. So when he was making that whip, it's entirely possible that he was considering what God had done for them. Those very people when he had set them free from the bondage of Egypt. And now they had forsaken all of that. And now they've made it all again about money. I'm just surmising. I used to be a children's pastor. Forgive me. Maybe he was looking forward in time. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows the beginning and the ending. Maybe he was looking forward in time to the days that we are in. The days of, I hate the word, televangelism. To a time of marketing and merchandising the free gifts of God. To gullible people, oftentimes so desperate they're, that they're willing to believe anyone and anything. Selling holy water and blessed rags and promises of answered prayer with the next thousand dollar vow. So I can go buy me a new car, a new house, and a new jet. The Bible says in verse 15 that Jesus drove them all out. Yes, he drove... Y'all ain't hearing me. He was not trying to be inclusive. He was to take a stand on what was right and what was wrong. Jesus, the Bible says, he drove them all out. Never get nervous when all the wrong people start leaving your life. Somebody ought to write that down. Never get nervous when all the wrong people start leaving your life. You need to learn how to operate in the gift of goodbye. You've got that employee at work. You've got that employee at work that, man, they do a good job, but all they do is create hell all over the place in that workplace. And the next thing you know, your little place where everybody was getting along and going well, now it has turned into WWE every week when you go to work, and now good people are starting to quit and leave and go away. You need to... <laughs> I'm going to sanctify it. Be glad when the wrong people. Sometimes it's not the devil pulling people out. Sometimes it's God. Sometimes it's God because he knows what you don't. He sees what you can't. And he hears the conversations that you have never heard. So let them go. And wave goodbye. What's interesting about this is that this was only the first time that he did this. You know your Bible. You know in, in, in Matthew chapter 21, he did it again. John chapter 2 was not the only time <laughs> that he flew iron in the temple. Matthew chapter 21, he did it again later on. Put it on the screen, Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold dove. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. But verse 14 is the most important verse in this whole section. The Bible says, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Underline that if you don't mind in your Bible, which shows us that as soon as he got that which was wrong out, then everyone who needed to be there came back. What a word to the church of the 21st century. That has, at this, at this moment, we have prestige, we have position, and we have money. The church of the 21st century, make no mistake about it, we are, in our own way, respectable. We've reached that place. We have prestige. We have position. We have nicely landscaped yards. We have signs out front that look really nice. But we are severely lacking in power to work the works of Jesus. I'm going to go there today before I get out of here. Mark chapter 16 says they will cast out devils. Do you all believe it? Most of the church world doesn't even believe in devils anymore. So how can you cast out something that you don't believe in? It says they will cast out devils. You can't cast out devils with no power. And you can't have any power without fasting. If it's been a little while since you've been fasting, you're already behind the eight ball. They shall speak with new tongues. Why will they do that? Because the old tongue was corrupt. And if your new tongue is still corrupt, 
Gossip, whisper, tailbearer, cussing, all that kind of stuff. You need to recheck yourself. They shall take up snakes. Oh, not me. Uh -uh. The devil is a liar, not this boy. Y'all take up snakes all you want to. I ain't touching one. I don't like them. They got no ears. I don't like them. Don't like them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Paul told Timothy that in the last days they will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. The power of God in our age is not for performance, but it is for the purposes of God. Amen. What I'm giving you this morning is meat and not milk, so take it in. The church, unfortunately, of our age has gotten comfortable with being comfortable and making it about everything except Jesus and His passion. We have gotten comfortable being comfortable. We, we started listening to what we like to hear. We've been fed a steady diet, unfortunately, for the last 15 years of be nice, be nice, be nice, fit in, and whatever you do, don't take a stand that offends anyone. We've been told, focus on philanthropy and not theology. In other words, meet the physical needs, but leave all of the spiritual needs that people have alone. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, go visit people in the hospital and in prison, but don't bring up the Word of God. Leave it out. And for goodness sakes, don't operate in the gifts, the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't do it. Lock the Holy Spirit into a prayer room if you want to. Keep Him in a back room somewhere where y'all do all that radical tongue stuff. But don't bring it out into the main house. And for goodness sakes, don't let Him come in. And here we are in the 21st century wondering why the church as an institution is getting smaller and smaller. And we can't figure out why. Ah, may be my last one, but it's going to be a good one. The reason is clear. 13,000 ex-churchgoers in 130 nations said, y'all must not believe it. Because if you believed it, everything would be different than it is. 13,000 people said, I can accept the blind leading the blind. All this stupidity that we've come to characterize as church now. But I cannot... Except the bland leading the bland. Somebody say passion. Passion is what happens when you get revelation. Jesus did what he did because he had the passion that comes from revelation. You have got to have passion in your life. And the only way that you can have passion for all the right things is to have a revelation from God about what the right things really are. They said... You hang out with gluttons and wine bibbers. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Those are the people that I'm here for. They said, you are the friend of sinners. Don't you know who you are hanging out with? Jesus said, those that are well do not need a physician, but those that are sick are the ones that need somebody to come along. They said... Avoid those people at all costs. Avoid them. They're bad for your reputation. But Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. They say, you have got to be liked to be listened to. If I hear one more stinking seminarian say that, I'm going to punch babies. <laughs> Edit that out. I don't know where that came from. I don't mean that. That was a ha-ha. Pastor says he's going to punch babies. We've been told in our seminaries, you've got to be liked to be listened to. You know, when my daddy was about to whip my tail, he didn't really ask me, do you like me? How you like me? No, what he said was, how you like me now? <laughs> so... You don't have to be liked to be listened to. He says, you will, in fact, otherwise be hated of all men for my name's sake. So if you want to be, if y'all church folk look at me, if you want to be popular, sell ice cream. Everybody who buys ice cream is happy. Sell puppies. Everybody who buys a puppy is happy. Passion. I feel this in my bones, y'all. Passion is what happens when you get tired of being passive, when God has called us to be active. You can only sit on that seat for so long. 
before that seat finally ruins you. Passion is what happens when you become passive, when you get tired of being passive, when God has called you to rise up. James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And 90% of the current church climate is to hear and not do. Passion comes when you get tired of ruts and routines and you start living by faith and trusting the Holy Spirit to lead you into life and where you're supposed to go. Passion comes when you stop watching and you start working. I want more of an amen than that. I'm going to preach it again next Sunday. Passion comes when you stop watching and you start working. And you say with Isaiah, here am I, Lord. Send me. When's the last time you said that? Most folks in church today are saying, there they are. Send them. (laughs) He's weird. He wants to do it. I'm too busy right now. I've been doing this a long time. So I know that people will do it for a while. Go to church, shake hands, fake the smile, fake being interested. Don't act like y'all don't do it. Sing the songs, listen to the sermon, do it again next week. Too real? But if we're not hungry for more, eventually you're going to be starved, but not hungry. If you're not seeking God for yourself, if you are not actively anticipating a move of God in your own life, if you are not actively praying, God, send a church revival. If you're not actively seeking miracles every day of your life, if you are yawning your way through every Sunday, then I'm going to tell you that eventually the beach will look better. The movies will be more interesting. Fishing will be more fun. Shopping will be more satisfying. And Sunday stops being about worship and starts to become Sunday fun day. 13,000 ex-church folks said we would go back if we saw intense conviction that fuels us and motivates us to compelling action, which tells me. Here comes your redneck pastor. That someone somewhere is waiting for somebody to start flipping over some flipping tables. If you're a man sitting here and you're not hearing what I'm saying, you need to check your man card. Somewhere someone is waiting for someone to start flipping tables. No? Okay, I'll say it this way. Then someone is waiting for their preacher to grow a backbone. And say the hard stuff. Pastor, stop tiptoeing around the controversial and say what needs to be said. God is still God. Sin is still sin. There are exactly two genders. Period. Say the hard stuff. Let's get it all at one time. Pronouns. Pronouns are made up foolishness. I will not refer to you as they, them, they, she. I will not. Demons in the Bible refer to themselves by multiple names. Abstinence is better than abortion. I just lost about half my crowd. God is holy. Adultery is sin. I'm on my way out so I can say it. I'm not concerned about the outspokenness of the sinners. I'm frustrated by the stillness and the silence of the saints. That's what I'm frustrated about. Y'all, when people are running around out in the world raising hell and acting like the fool and they get outspoken, I don't get nervous about that. I don't get worried about it. But I am wondering, where's all the Jesus people that should be saying something other than what all of those knuckleheads are saying? Am I right? Thank you. Rex Rex said, you're always right. Come on, son. The place kicker 
for the Kansas City Chiefs stands up in a commencement speech and says to the potential mothers in that audience, maybe the best usage of your life is not to go out and jump into the corporate world and live that kind of life. Maybe the best usage of your life is to grow up and raise your own children. And the world went nuts. They wanted to cancel him. They wanted the Kansas City Chiefs to fire him. They wanted the quarterback to not play on the same team because he said that. They tried to cancel him, but the truth in his message was so powerful and so real that millions stood up and said, he's right. He's right. And we, someone's got to back him up. Pastor, church member, the world is waiting for someone to start flipping tables again. It's time for the tables to turn. And let's not, let's not fool ourselves. That is exhausting. Amen. We're going to flip some tables. <laughs> it's exhausting. It's exhausting to be the square peg in the round hole. It's exhausting to be the one that they're always laughing at and sneering at and scorning. It's exhausting. Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah got depressed by it. He said, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to shut up and I'm not going to speak anymore in his name. I'm not going to say another word. But in Jeremiah 20, he said, his word was in my bones like a fire. His word was in me like a fire shut up in my bones. And I could not withhold it. You need a little bit of that. I need a little bit of that. In 2 Kings 2, Elijah was about to be taken up into heaven. And when he looked down at Elisha, he said, what you want? <laughs> I want twice what you got. No shame in his game, y'all. I've seen you do it, man. I've seen the miracles that you've done. I've seen you do it. I want to do twice that. What? That was passion. I want twice what you have. Four men brought a paralyzed man to a place where Jesus was. And when they got there, there was no room. They didn't say, oh, too bad, Frank. We'll, we'll bring you next time. No, they climbed up on the roof. And they tore off a hole in the roof. I don't know who owned that house, but I would have been ticked. They tore a hole in his roof and dropped him down. It's not just sad. It's sinful when the world has more passion than we do. They'll spend time and money and effort. They'll make absolute fools out of themselves for their cause. They will strip naked. I saw it just last week at a pride parade. Strip butt naked and walk down the street in front of everybody with no clothes on. To glorify sin. It's not just sad. It's sinful. When we can barely drag ourselves to church. Because I don't know if I want to go today. Oh, it's sprinkling outside. It's, it, I, the, 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 low tide, the waves are going off at the beach. Why aren't... I'm going after something today. Might be my last one, but it, it'll be a good one. Why aren't people flocking to church anymore? Why is there not a line out front? I mean, we got a full building in the summer. Awesome. But why is there not a, a line out front? People pressing to get in. And somebody actively contemplating, how can I tear the roof off and get in that place? Sometimes it's because, not necessarily here, but sometimes it's because we look like an episode of The Walking Dead. You've got to go to church. <laughs> Y'all clap your hands. Right? I didn't literally mean that. I was trying to make a point. Y'all are like, I ain't missing it. I ain't missing it. <laughs> ah. Or, 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 another possibility, we are tripping over nothing. All the time. Don't we do it? We trip over nothing. We're supposed to be engaged in the, the evangelization of the lost soul. Reaching the lost. Discipling the saved. 
preparing them to go out and do the same thing. Reach the lost, disciple the saved. Reach the lost, disciple the saved. But we keep tripping over nothing. I talked to a man a few months ago who told me that he was leaving the church that he had been in since he was a child. And I asked him why. You've been there since you were a child. What happened? Was it compromise or hypocrisy or false doctrine? Was it, was it any of those things? He said, no. Let me tell you what they did. They switched the contemporary and the traditional service. We've always had the traditional service at 11 and the contemporary service at 9. But they outgrew the service at 9 and now they're going to move that service to the 11 and they're going to move the traditional back to the 9 o'clock and I'm leaving. You want my opinion? You're an idiot. You're an idiot. They're reaching people. The church is filling up. There are people who are pressing to get in there because they want to be a part of that. And you want to leave because they... Now you've got to go to 9 o'clock and still... Shut up. <laughs> Passion. Intense conviction that fuels or motivates us to compelling action. Church folk, say what you believe and then believe what you say. And then act out on what you said you believed and believed what you said. Then you put it into passion. Burn with a passion for the things of God. You've got to. The fire on the inside of you these days has to be burning brighter and hotter than the fire that is on the outside. Stand when everyone else is sitting down. Stand. We used to sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus. No, we, we quit singing that. Stand when everyone else is sitting down. Stay. When everyone else walks away. When it would be easier for you to just walk away and act like you didn't see that person who needs your help. The homeless person that needs your help. Walk away when they say, hey, we need you at dining with dignity. Come down here and feed 80 to 100 people. Nah, it's a little too hard. It's too hot. It might rain. I don't think I want to do that. Stay when everyone else walks away. Be bold when everyone else is cowering. I look for people that are bold. Man, I look for people that just stand for what they believe in. They may not like it, but they will respect it. Believe the Bible. Singers, y'all, come rescue me. And I'm going to say something that Jared's going to have to fix next week. Be willing to sacrifice. I'm so sick that we have taken the word sacrifice out of our vocabulary. Oh, it's not fun. It's not supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a sacrifice. That's why we call it sacrifice. Be willing to be inconvenienced. At one time, I talked about moving Sunday service from Sunday at 10 o'clock to Sunday night at 10 o'clock. <laughs> I got that same look. Why? Just to make it inconvenient. To see who really wanted to be there. See, this is comfortable. We get it here at 10. We're going to be done by 11.30. We're going to get to the lunch place. It's going to be great. But if you make it inconvenient, would we still show up? Ah, it's 10 o'clock. I promise you, I wouldn't because I'm old. I'm in bed by 7 o'clock. Be willing to give. Oh, there it is. That church always asking about money. They want my money. Be willing to serve. Be willing to serve. Will be healed. 
If Jesus cares, so do I. If Jesus stands, so do I. If Jesus confronts it, so do I. Don't ask me to mollycoddle it. Don't ask me to act like I don't know that that's what he wants. If Jesus confronts it, so will I. If Jesus loves, so will I. See, somebody's going to hear something in the sermon and think, he hates those people. No, no. I hate the sin, but I love the people. If Jesus welcomes, so will I. If Jesus forgives, so will I. If Jesus rejects, so will I. And if Jesus flips a table over, come get some. So will I. I've been waiting for that one. That's my kind of party. His passion is our standard. Period. His passion is our standard. Not your denomination, not your creed, not your tradition. His passion is our standard. Not your comfort, not your convenience. His passion is our standard. Not the culture, not their acceptance or rejection. His passion is our standard. WWJD is not just a bumper sticker. It's true. That's all I got to say. Heads bowed, would you open your hearts with me, please? I'm so excited about this. Because this is like one of those lines in the sand, isn't it? It's a beautiful line in the sand. I mean, <laughs> nobody's going to walk out here this morning and say, I don't think I understood him. <laughs> no. I think everybody's going to walk out saying, I, I clearly understood what he said. So with heads bowed and hearts open, my, my heart is this, that someone will hear this and it will stir some kind of something inside of you. We don't need any more boring churches. We need some burning churches. Which translates to this, that we don't need any more boring believers. We need some burning believers. You and I, we both need something in our lives. We need fresh fire, a freshness, a fresh anointing from God. I would love to see this thing burst into a revival today. I would love to see a revival break out right in here right now as believers rush to an altar and kneel down and pray until they pray through, like the old saints used to say. Until the Spirit of God comes and touches their life and they rise up from that secret place of prayer somewhat more than they were when they knelt down. To seek God. To pray for revival. I would love to see a fresh, fresh fire start in this place today. So Father, I have, as I understand, obediently shared your word. Turn this water into wine. And God, I don't know what you're doing around the world and around the world in other churches, but God, let this place have a fresh fire. Let this people have a renewal in us. God, let us seek your heart like never before, God. Let us see a response to a word from heaven. If it's true, church folks are going to walk out and never go back by the year 2050. We need to disrupt that. Jared feels, and I believe, that there has already begun to be a stirring in the spirit realm of revival. When Oklahoma, and I may get the names wrong, but help me if I get them wrong. When Oklahoma says that we are going to bring back prayer into the schools. When Louisiana says we are putting Bibles back in classrooms. When they say those kinds of things, that tells me that people have gotten tired of the ridiculousness that's going on around them. We've realized that we cannot make it without the Spirit of God in our life. Something is happening. There are revivals breaking out all around the world. 
I'm praying, God, let it happen here as well. Stop tripping over what is inconsequential. And start focusing on what matters all across the building. If you wouldn't mind, bowed head. In a moment, I'm going to give an invitation for prayer. I pray that if you need reviving in your life, you come. If you need Jesus in your life, you come. If you need a renewal, if you, if you know that right now there's just that lethargy or lethargy that has settled down over your life and you say, Lord, I just need a fresh anointing. Altar workers this morning, I want us to anoint people. I want us to anoint people. If somebody says, I need fresh oil, well, we're going to give you some. We're going to lay our hands on the sick and believe that if you came here this morning and you're sick, we're going to pray the prayer of faith for you to be healed. We're going to believe God together. I'm just believing. I'm just believing. Something special here this morning. Something a little bit more than another yawn on another Sunday. And we'll just come back and do it again next week. Lord, give us a fresh fire across the building if you wouldn't mind to stand up on your feet those of you that are at home watching right there where you are start praying if that's your prayer put it in the, the chat so that we can pray for you we want to pray a freshness so this morning in this building I don't care how long it takes and if you want to hear what we're doing into the future stay to the end don't, don't rush out and leave but just stick around it'll be worth it but if you this morning are in here this morning and something in you wants to respond to the word that you've just heard Come find a place to pray. Kneel down and seek the Lord. And if, and if that's what you want, we will anoint you and pray for you. If you just need a fresh movement of God in your life, let's believe that today. If y'all will, come on out, ladies. Somebody say, Lord, we need a fresh fire. Don't let me walk out of this place today without at least attempting to seek your heart. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.